Hello and welcome to another episode of The State of Politics. Myself and Patrick McGilp are delighted to be joined today by former Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, as well as many other roles. Rosanna was also Scotland's longest serving parliamentarian up until 2021, which is now fulfilled by John Swinney. Today we're delighted to be joined by Rosanna Cunningham from Perth. Rosanna, how are you? I am fine, thank you very much. Nice to talk to you all. It's a real pleasure to have you on. So just to kick off, could you give us a bit of your background of how you get into politics and where your first interest came? Well, um, slightly odd, I suppose, in my case. Um, my mother and father weren't the slightest little bit political, so I didn't learn it at home. Um, we emigrated to Australia when I was eight years old, just going on nine. And I remember being very strongly... Uh, I mean, that was a huge thing to happen. I mean, at that age, that's that's massive. Um, and and I'm so old that we went by sea, not by air. And I remember as the ship pulled away from the docks in Southampton, um, saying to mum and dad that I wanted to go home. I wanted to go home to Scotland. Um, and in a sense, I never changed my mind about that. And my brother, who is currently a senior councillor in Glasgow Council, uh, was uh, a year and a half younger than me. Um, and he uh, was along with me saying the same thing. Um, and neither of us ever changed our minds. So it started, I suppose, with that kind of really strong identification with being Scottish, um, maybe provoked by the experience of being taken away and off out to Australia um, at that age. I, you know, it'd be very difficult. You, you probably ought to consult a child psychologist to get some more background on that. Um, I did have an, a relative in Australia, though, who was a Labour MP in Western Australia. And he had won, ironically, a by-election. So I was not the first by-election winner in my family. Um, and my earliest active recollection of politics was uh, Labour Party events in Western Australia marches and um, those political party social events that I remember quite clearly and I'm going back right now into the very early 60s with that whole air of and you'll all have been there not quite enough people to fill the venue that was organized and that slightly forced we are really having a good time at this event even though in reality everybody knows that hand over money because it's actually about fundraising. So nothing is different um, in that sense. But I remember them quite well. And I remember speaking to my Uncle Harry about politics because I was curious about what it was he actually did. And I remember having that conversation with him when I was in the car with him one day when I was only about 10 and, and he said, oh, if you're interested in politics, I have got lots of books. And I thought, to him, I mean, I'm now thinking, well, I don't know that the books my uncle Harry had were going to be much use to a 10 year old. But but uh, so so I can't rule out that there was that experience in the family. And so I had an uncle Frank who was um, a chiropractor and I had an uncle John who was a plumber and I had an uncle Jock who um, worked down the docks and my uncle Harry, who had also worked down the docks but had got elected um, uh, to the Labour Party, he was a politician. So you don't make any, you don't really make distinctions at that age. You just have people in the family that do things. And there was my uncle Harry and he was, he was a politician. So I can't, I can't ignore that that must have had an impact. Um, and then I went through a period of time when I was fascinated by Scottish history um, so I'm talking about 11, 12, 13 I was really, really, really fascinated by Scottish history and then somewhere along the line I got somewhere along the line I, I began to understand that there was something going on in Scotland that was more current um, and when I was 15, the year I was going to be 16, when I was 15, Winnie Ewing won the Hamilton by-election. And that did, that news did go around the world. And by that point, I had already become so 
much of the view that Scotland should be its own place, that it that it should be um, uh, its own country. It should be, and that's how I would have thought about it at the time. I don't think I had the kind of political concept of independence in my head, but I, but I, but I knew that I felt that Scotland shouldn't be part of this bigger thing. Um, and then the news about Winnie Ewing's uh, success at Hamilton and the, for me, revelatory uh, uh, experience of discovering that there was an entire political party <laughs> that kind of fitted where I was coming from. And that was it. So I wrote to the SNP straight after that and uh, bless them. They sent back a whole bunch of stuff. 12,000 miles away out to Australia to a 15-year-old girl. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> and I, um, I, I just think, you know, and as, as when I did come back, which was obviously a good few years later, I knew I was coming back to be a member of the SNP, to be part of what that was all about. That was why I wanted to come back to Scotland. And so I was never in any doubt about what I wanted to do. So in the meantime, I did the politics degree because I thought, well, you know, interested in politics, could do a politics degree. So that's kind of really how it came about. And I came back eventually in 1976 in December. And by March 1977, I was working as a research assistant at party headquarters. So um, I believe I might have been the very first ever party apparatchik to have actually been elected to parliament. <laughs> Uh, so you say you joined the party when you were 15. Uh, you were never tempted by the Labour Party, I take it, and you, you never considered leaving the party because you were employed at headquarters within six months of coming home, sort of thing. Can you talk yeah. us through that period of first being working in headquarters and obviously it was a referendum in the Scottish Parliament in 1979? So I should say that I was a member of the Labour Party, but that was the Australian Labour Party. Um, <laughs> which was not precluded by SNP membership for obvious reasons, because I wasn't living in Scotland. And I did join the Australian Labour Party for a couple of years. Um, it was at the time Australia was still a combatant in the Vietnam War, and I was very strongly motivated by anti-war, anti-Vietnam um, uh, stances. And uh, the Australian Labour Party was particularly anti-war as well. Um, so we were all of us doing that huge big heave to try and get the what are called the Liberals in Australia but are actually the Tories um, out of government after a very long period of time and get the Labour Party in. So I had um, I had joined the Labour Party in Australia. When I came back from uh, Australia to Scotland, no, I didn't have any doubt. I, I joined the local party branch within literally within a week or two of arriving back in Scotland. And I, it was it was somebody in the branch who saw the advert for the job at headquarters, um, and and drew my attention to it. And I I went along. The job as advertised was um, slightly more uh, um, senior um, than the one I got because I mean I came out of nowhere. But but obviously they were just a little bit taken aback by my enthusiasm so they find a job for me anyway um, and I went to work for headquarters now that was right at the start of 1977 we had 11 MPs at the time um, uh, it, it was a period of time when we were doing well in the opinion polls um, uh, I you know um, we, we thought uh, I think that that was going to be the the point at which we were going to take off. There was a huge amount of um, enthusiasm and experience and party headquarters had a fair number of people working for it in different roles um, and uh, and 11 MPs. Um, and in 1978, so that was in 77, in 1970, at the end of 1977, I think it was, a, uh, the, the, you know, it, it, it was a kind of fairly, um, fragile government and it ended up with a sort of Labour Lib Dem co well, Labour Liberal understanding in the House of Commons because we were nearly going to go into an election 
uh, a general election. I think if there had been a general election at that point, I think it was late 77, then, then we would have done extremely well. Um, and that didn't happen because the Liberals went into an agreement with the Labour Party at the time. We then had a series of by-elections in 1978. And the best thing that I could say is that they just came the wrong way around for us. The, there, was, there was one, I think, had it come first, we would have won. And if we had won it, then there would have been a bit of a roll-on effect into the second one. We probably never would have won the third one, which was Berwick and East Lothian, but, but they just came the wrong way around. Um, and, and that began to create confidence problems, the sort of thing that happens in politics when you can just see confidence leeches away. Um, and then we went into 1979 when there was the the referendum campaign at that time, which, you know, we were campaigning in the middle of blizzards because it was on the 1st of March. So we were campaigning January and February. I mean, I remember standing in streets in Edinburgh in, in blizzard conditions and it was just crazy. And of course it was. We did win the referendum, of course. We got over 50% of the vote, but we hadn't reached that artificial threshold that had been um, built in. And then the general election followed that immediately, and that was just catastrophic for us. And then oh, they made half the staff redundant, and I was in the <laughs> half of <made> redundant. So. <laughs> on that uh, 40% rule, well, Rosanna, were, were you aware on the doorstep campaigning how high a target that was to hit and was it affecting confidence or was this something that people didn't really know about until the results came in? I don't think ordinary people really understood it to be perfectly honest. Um, I had I had had conversations at headquarters before that because in Australia if you want to make a change to the Australian constitution which is a written document you require to have a majority of the votes in a majority of the states and I remember having a conversation at headquarters, and I'm not going to claim it as any great prophetic understanding. It was just because of the experience in Australia, knowing what Australian constitutional law required. And I remember saying, what if they do some kind of, you know, formula approach? But at that time, people wouldn't, didn't believe that would ever happen because you know that just was not there'd been a 1975 referendum about the eu remember and that didn't have any sort of threshold built in so there was just no expectation that this one would be any different and of course it was i also at the time was doing most of my campaigning in the middle of edinburgh so you were going up and down courses in you know the high street and all the rest of it where it was patently obvious that half these people you know you just you 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 just had that whole sense and understanding of how really hard it was going to be and trying to get the point across to people that if they didn't vote they were effectively voting no um and uh but but that wasn't something because it had never been done before it was very hard to get to get people to understand that that was going to be the impact of it. Um, so we were all absolutely devastated at the way it worked out in terms of the result. It almost would have been better had we not gone over the 50%, because at least then you would have thought, well, we would have lost it anyway. But that, that business of it going over the 50%, but not reaching this artificial threshold um, was, was something that um, uh, was something that was particularly bitter uh, but I mean I remember the campaigning I remember the yes for Scotland offices that were above what used to be the Covenanter pub up the Royal Mile um, uh, I can remember the dreadful food that we lived on pies and cream throughout the whole thing um, I can just remember the appalling weather um, that we were all doing it in but you know and we were up at the crack of dawn and we were not leaving until about you know, two o'clock in the morning and then getting up and doing it all over again. So it was, and I was, I was sneaking off from headquarters because there was a bit of thing about, you know, should SNP people be involved in the SNP only campaign or part of the Yes for Scotland now, you know, so that 
continues to be a little bit of an issue. Um, uh, and, you know, it was an issue back then. And so I was being, you know, my immediate superiors were just saying, just go up, just go up, just go up. I had to pretend I was going to the library um, in case some of the other folk who weren't so keen on that happening found out. <laughs> so it was just all of that. You know, it, everything repeats itself, if you see what I mean. You just, you yeah. just the same thing coming around again and again and again. So you spoke about that 1979 referendum, Rosanna, and you returned to then go and do a law degree after. Yeah. Um, during those years of the 80s, obviously you were an onlooker to that Thatcher government while well, going through your degree and then going on to be a solicitor. Did that always fuel you, fuel you that you wanted to get back into politics, seeing what was happening across the UK and here in Scotland that, you know, we had saw a, a complete you know, a disaster in the country. Did that always make you give you the urge to get back into politics but as an onlooker? The first thing we did after the referendum and the election was to form the seventy nine group in the SNP, um, and uh, you know that became a huge internal issue, and it was very much predicated on looking at where we'd got the vote out from for the referendum. Who were the people that were voting? Um, uh, for this, where should the SNP think about focusing some of its activity and work in a way that it hadn't done in the past? Um, and there were seven or eight of us who kicked off right at the start to form the 79 group, and then it became this huge thing. So for those early 79 into the early 80s years, I, w I was, and I was kind of unemployed because I couldn't go straight to do the law degree. So I got made redundant after the elections in 1979, but I couldn't go to university that autumn because I hadn't been back from Australia for three years. So I was still classified as an overseas student. So I had to wait until 1980 to go to university. So I had this big long period of time when I was either unemployed or just working as a waitress or doing things like that. And I had an enormous amount of time to focus on the 79 group. And I mean, we had, we had membership cards and we had our own banner. So we were a real problem, seen as a real problem within the SNP, but we were all staying in the SNP and having this really big um, ideological debate within the SNP. And that, I think, is probably what sustained a lot of us because it gave us something really big to focus on at the same time as, the, um, as Thatcherism was causing such devastation. So in that sense, I never really left politics. I mean, I stood... I stood as a as a candidate in local elections, uh, getting completely duffed up in terms of the vote and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, and then eventually, when I did get my law degree and did the diploma, I then got a job through in the west of Scotland and moved through to the west of Scotland and and kind of kept doing kept doing the same the same thing there. Even you know when the seventy nine group sort of disbanded. Um, internally, um, and uh, but we, we we just kept going. So in that sense, I never I never stopped being interested in politics. I was I was doing it all of that time, and it's it, I guess it's a thing that people don't um, realize how many people who are actively involved in politics. It's only a tiny number that ever get elected to anything, but that doesn't mean to say that all of the other people who are involved are not involved in politics. They are. They're just not elected. Uh, politicians, but they are still um, very much part of the movement. And most of us, even those of us who have been elected, will spend different parts of our lives, you know, it, you know, in the other kind of way. So I wasn't an elected politician until 1995, and then I was for 25 years, and now I'm back to not being an elected politician. But it doesn't mean I'm no longer in politics. So I kind of quite strongly want people, I think, to really understand that, that you can be in politics um, without actually being elected. On the 79 group, Rosanna, uh, Michael Foote was obviously the Labour leader at the time. Was this very much a, a left-wing group but for people who supported independence within the SNP? And also with the people that were involved, I think Alex Salmond and both Margot MacDonald were involved in it as well. Why do you think so many people in the group went on to have such big careers within the party? So I think it was, it was a very ideological group. So we didn't do a lot of attacking individuals. We did a lot of arguing about politics and ideology and where the vote would come from. I remember somebody else saying, actually it was an activists group. Um, uh, and when you, when you look at the original 
names and and uh, what have you of all the people that we'd amassed that were interested in it. It was all people who were, you know, branch organisers, constituency organisers, all the people who'd been doing things on the ground um, and had actually seen um, in reality what what was happening during the referendum campaign and all the rest of it. So um, I think that that was a kind of really big part of it. Um, and because most of us were very much focused on that on that discussion about politics, I think in a you know for a lot of people we were the ones who were having the political discussions, and therefore it, it became I think uh, uh, the, the 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 case that they would you know individuals would go on to be seen to be um, uh, folk that you might want uh, in in senior positions in the party. Um, which is which is not to say we weren't right from the start building that kind of thing. I mean, you know, we had our slate of candidates and we would sit around and we would decide who and how and what. And, and that was much frowned upon at the time in the SNP. Everybody takes it for granted now. But at the time, that was very frowned upon that you would have this slate of candidates. Um, and um, so so we were kind of on the way to doing all of that. And, and it was inevitable, I think, that certain numbers of individuals would then start to get elected uh, um, into positions simply because of the nature of what we were doing and how we were doing it. We were, I, we were almost, if you like, modernising things a bit, bringing bringing actual kind of politics into a political party, which I know seems a bit daft, um, but but the SNP um, had has continually had to do that. So Billy Wolf was a big moderniser in the 60s, but then there needed to be another wave of it coming along. So, you know, political parties change all the time. So I, I think it was just one of those, um, one of those organisations that always, almost kind of delivered the kind of political training to a lot of people who then did go on to become um, elected uh, or, or senior officials and onto the NEC and you know I was on the NEC for years and you you know that was that you know so that that began to change um uh how the SNP was presenting itself gradually as the as 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 an older generation gave way to a newer generation but of course that keeps happening that just keeps renewing itself which it has to do of course because if you don't do that then parties just just eventually um drift off into irrelevance so you have to keep changing and modernising. Rosanna, you spoke about a, a newer generation coming through there into the party and obviously one of those people is the current leader of the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon. You've known Nicola for a long, long time. Did you <laughs> did you ever realise, you know, was there ever a point that you thought she would go on to be Scotland's first minister? We've had Linda on the show, she said she was always quite geeky and would always kind of not come to stuff because she was doing political stuff, but yeah. You know, I think Nicola, you're one of the folks she certainly looks up to in the party. And um, did you just always think that Nicola would be destined to be the party leader one day? No, I didn't think that at all. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you know, necessarily. But I met Nicola when she was still very young, so you couldn't really have 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 been thinking along those uh, along those lines. I mean, I think she was still in her late teens when I met, first met her, so you could hardly really have thought to yourself, well. Look at that eighteen-year-old. She's going to be the first minister because when I met Nicola, you know, there was no parliament to be a first minister of, and all the rest of it. So, um, uh, so I don't know. I, I I I don't think that. I think you could have probably pointed to there being a few people that might um, fill that. I mean, obviously, as the years go by, you, you can see that that Nicola herself is is changing, um, uh, and um, and and therefore um, being. Um, being more able to be seen in that in that regard, but I'm not. I I wouldn't have said so right from the very start. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily have said so. But then I met Nicola um, uh, when Nicola was a lot younger uh, than when Linda met her. By the time Linda was meeting Nicola, Nicola was was you know a good bit older than when I first met her. So so you know as 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 people change and focus, then. Um, uh, uh, then you, you start to see um, different aspects of them and, and what they're capable of. And that's that's not always really very obvious, particularly in a period of time when you've got very few elected members. It's not very obvious because how do how do people demonstrate capability in those circumstances? 
um, uh, because until you're actually elected, the, the, the impact of that and the, and the way you manage it is not really going to be very clear. You, you, you know, there are lots of people in lots of parties who everybody thinks going to be an absolute star and they get into politics Ooh, and they're not really very starry at all. So it doesn't, you know, and I'm not going to name names, but, but we've had a few, and other parties have had a few as well, and I'm sure there are one or two that you can think of um, where everybody anticipated that they were going to be absolutely brilliant, and they just turn out not to be able to do it at all, because politics is actually a thing. You have to, to be good at it. Being good at something else, like being a good businessman or being a good lawyer or, or being a good, you know, university lecturer doesn't make you a good politician it doesn't tra necessarily always translate um so people come trailing clouds of glory and then uh you know in the first year or two of a parliamentary career the clouds of glory dissipate and become not such wonderful clouds after all and then often those people find a, they just move away back out again um and they're the, the expectation that they were going to be absolute rising stars is, is forgotten about. Politics is full of folk who came and went um, uh, uh, on that basis. Businessmen, I think, are particularly prone to being in that group. And you can see that at Westminster. There have been some people who were going to be this great, you know, um, there's one who's never off our telly even just now. I also think Lord Digby is one of those who everybody thought would be a great politician, but being a good businessman doesn't mean you're going to be a good politician because the, the talent you need is different. Mm. It's a different, different way of thinking and a different talent. You know? So I don't think you can always tell straight away whether people are going to be really good politicians. <laughs> I think it's just one of those things you, you have to wait and see and work out because sometimes the most unlikely people turn out to be really fantastic. 100%. Um, you obviously won a famous by-election in 1995 for Perth. Um, can you talk us through how you became sort of the candidate for Perth, uh, what it was like to, to campaign and win? Because I think Labour were well ahead in the polls up and down the country at that point with Tony Blair in charge. And I think there was only three SNP MPs. So mm -hmm. what was that campaign like and what was it like first going down to Westminster? Well, I was already the candidate here. I had been selected as a candidate here right at the beginning of 1990 after Jim Fairley Sr. had stood down. Um, and uh, I'd stood in the 1992 general election. Um, both John Swinney and I were candidates in each of the Perthshire seats and everybody confidently expected that we were gonna win these two seats. These were our most winnable seats in Scotland. And everybody confidently expected in 1992 um, that we would take these two Perthshire seats. Um, and the only people that didn't agree with that were the voters. And, uh, and it, neither John nor I um, won in 1992. And remember, that was the one that John Major won again when nobody had expected him to win the election. So that was all a bit, all a bit, ooh, back to the drawing board. Um, so when the by-election came around, when the uh, MP Sir Nicholas Fairbairn died, um, I mean, obviously, because I'd been the candidate already, um, everybody assumed that uh, I would be the by-election candidate. Uh, didn't quite work out as easily as that. Um, you're all far too young to remember, but um, there was an enormous hoo-ha um, about my potential candidacy um, and a big attempt to block me from being the candidate. So it wasn't a very pleasant selection campaign and the party was in a bit of an uproar. Um, uh, going into what should have been uh, expectations were high of, of a really good um, result. So it was all a bit of a burr. Um, and uh, um, the net outcome was I did end up becoming the candidate, but I didn't, the election committee rejected me the first time around. Um, and so then I, I had to be brought back in to be the candidate. So it wasn't by any means um, an easy process. Um, and the by-election itself uh, was extraordinary uh, because in those days, it, these were the only times that Scottish politics was just about Scottish politics, you know, a by-election. And, and it was a huge thing because it was seen as the last, you know, by that point, 
John Major's government was looking really ropey, every by-election he was losing, so every by-election was a big thing. So the, the media were from all over the UK for this by-election. It was massive. Um, and the SNP had this um, feminist, socialist, Republican candidate um, to present to what everybody thought was a Tory seat. So you can see what the, the roots of some of the early anxiety about my candidacy were. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, we had a press conference every single day at which the entire mass ranks of not just the Scottish media, but the whole of the UK media and quite a lot of international media were at them every single day. So it was nerve wracking, stressful. Um, and it was really easy to, to create headlines. So my stance on the monarchy became a big issue um, very early on. Um, and I um, uh, helped make it a bigger issue by, by coming up with my line about the monarchy being the pinnacle of the class system, which I thought at least had, <laughs> had the um, uh, had an air of honesty about it, because, uh, you know, you can't really say that's not the case. Um, but of course, it was precisely the thing that the, the media wanted to make a big issue of. Interestingly enough, quite a lot of the local members of the SNP were saying to me, don't worry about it. That isn't necessarily going to be a problem in Perthshire. Because the, the understanding that, you know, Perthshire was a Tory seat overlooked the reality of an, a lot of very ordinary people in Perthshire, some of whom had experience with the kind of landed classes that weren't experiences that they were particularly happy about. And therefore they had a sort of, um, uh, re, you know, sort of resistance. And I, I, and I would, I, I would kind of, I, I sort of call it a kind of rural radicalism that you, you, you came across that, that, you know, and it was a sort of anti-feudalism, anti, anti, anti-layeredism and all the rest of it. So indeed it, well, it turned out quite quickly, and I think the party realised quite quickly that it wasn't such a big deal as they might have thought it could have been. Um, but, you know, I'm, I was interested in the fact that at this particular election that we've just had, there was a lot of people moaning about, ooh, we shouldn't be selecting candidates who don't come from the area that they're elected in. Well, I was a complete outsider. You know, I, I lived in Glasgow. The, the only actual connection I had um, with Perth was having grown up in Western Australia and gone to university um, it, 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 in Western Australia, so we can tell a little story about it. But I didn't have a background from Perthshire. Um, I was the outsider. I was the and that and but you can overcome that. <clears throat> Don't, I mean, I get a little bit worried that people just think that you should only ever have a political candidate from the area in, in which they um, they they live, grow, and work, and all the rest of it. Because I think you can overlook um, very very many incredibly um, uh, good um, members of parliament for local constituencies who didn't start out being local. Um, uh, now, obviously, I did move here, um, and um, and and that changes it. But 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 I I you know I just worry that we don't end up in a situation where we we tell ourselves that that can never happen. So the by election itself was exhausting. And yes, you're right, there were only three MPs. And then I went down and I became the fourth MP, uh, which was a huge relief to them because I was promptly nominated to be the spokesperson on a whole range of subjects because, you know, now there was another person that you could just push a whole load of stuff onto. <laughs> um, environment and land reform. That was two of the things that I was doing down there. So I was speaking about deer management in the House of Commons in the late 90s and I was speaking about deer management in the Scottish Parliament in the, in the in, you know, like 25 years later. So um, home affairs, all the justice kind of stuff. Can't remember what else I was doing. You know, there was a whole, you, you, you had to do a whole range of things. And it wasn't a very great place to be, I have to say. I spent a lot of my time plotting how I could not have to go there, how I could be in the constituency as much as possible. Um, and minimised the amount of time I was there because I didn't uh, didn't much care for the atmosphere, has to be said. And uh, I mean, it was exciting 
being elected to the place, uh, you know, anybody would be. Um, but, um, but it felt to me like it was very closed off from the real world. You, you went into the building and, and there was no real interaction anywhere else except with your, with your constituency. And of course, if you're a Scottish MP, your constituency is 450, 500 miles away. So, as I said, I spent a fair part of my time at the House of Commons plotting my um, escape as much as possible um, and being in the constituency as much as I possibly could be. I think that was something, Rosanna, that Henry McLeish touched on in the, the Parliament's 20th year, that, you know, there was such a disconnect between Westminster and anybody living in Scotland, especially as a constituent. I mean, I think for me, Patrick's generation would probably take Holyrood for granted, you know, that it's on our doorstep, everybody in the country can get to it fairly quickly in a train or whatnot, and it is there if our MSPs are accessible. And I think even when you look at Westminster from the outside, looking in at the pomp whenever it's Queen's Speech or... PMQs and they're all shouting at each other and you know it's very I think it's very distant as you say from the real world so you then kind of brought yourself into the real world when you get first elected to Holyrood how refreshing was that to well it wasn't Holyrood then but how refreshing was it first to be elected to the Scottish Parliament and the contrast and, and what was the, the contrast and atmosphere like coming from Westminster to then Scottish Parliament? Well, it was enormous. I mean, it, it was, as you say, in, in, in terms comparative to the House of Commons local. Um, now, I appreciate that if, you, if you're from Orkney or Shetland or the Western Isles, Edinburgh isn't necessarily local, um, but it's a damn sight more local than it would be. If it's um, and uh, the chances, I mean, just at a very simple level, um, in, in the time that I was in, I was in the House of Commons for six years, um sort of 75 uh sorry 95 to 99 i was simply an mp and then 99 to 2001 i was also an msp but in the six years i was in the house of commons i only had constituents down in 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 london a handful of times whereas you know when you're in edinburgh you've got constituents you know wanting to come and see it and, 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 and coming quite often. You had school, squads of school kids come to Edinburgh, but you hardly ever had schools in, 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 you know, in London from Scotland. Now, I dare say the MPs that lived in, that lived and were representing London constituencies got a lot of it, but, but anybody that had to travel any length to get to London, you know, you weren't going to be seeing people on anything like the same basis. I mean, there were times I thought I saw friends from Australian days more often than I saw people coming down from Scotland, because obviously, if you're traveling over and doing your holiday um, from Australia and you've got a pal that's in the House of Commons, it's, that's a great thing. You get a tour of the House of Commons, you get taken to your dinner, you know, you get that. That's great. Um, and I have had, in fact, I just emailed this morning one of my friends who I'd been over on a number of occasions doing exactly that, you know, coming into the House of Commons. So I would see them because they were on holiday and, and coming to the House of Commons would be part and parcel of what they got as a tourist that they mo you know most tourists wouldn't get because they wouldn't necessarily have a pal in the House of Commons. But you were conscious that your constituents really weren't in that in that group. And and only very rarely was there was there were there people from Scotland down. You got things like uh, the Scotch Whiskey Association, um, you know, you got there were there were certain biggish events each year that happened. That, that some of the, that, that were like lobbying and you got some of the big groups. But even the, you know, even if you think about it, the smaller organisations in Scotland couldn't really afford to do that um, up and down. So um, you, you, you relied on the time that you had in Scotland to, to be the, you know, where you understood what people in Scotland were, were really thinking. And 25 years ago, um, yeah, we had email, but we didn't have social media. So um, you didn't have the speed that we have now with social media to be to be actually getting a very fast sense of what's happening. Um, email, you had email, but you, people treated that as if it was letters rather than rather than the speed with which we now do social media. So it was a kind of different world, and um, and I think I think that making sure you were keeping in touch with Scotland 
would be quite difficult for a lot of people. And I think it's why a lot of politicians got unstuck um, badly, came badly unstuck. Um, and, and, you know, once upon a time, an MP would maybe only visit the constituency once a month or something, simply because of the travel involved. I mean, at least for the time I was doing it, you were flying up and down. But if you think about 50 years previously, it would have been long train journeys. So, so really going up and down, even on a weekly basis, wasn't a particularly easy thing to do. So the, the, the MP arriving in the constituency was a really big deal once upon a time. And yet where ideas now have flipped completely, haven't they? So the expectation is that, that MPs and MSPs are visible yep. in a way that they weren't. Once upon a time, their visibility was what they did in the House of Commons. Now the visibility isn't about what they do in the parliament. It's about where they're seen in the community and how they interact with the community. And I think that's actually a really good thing. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the, the Scottish Parliament finally coming into existence 20 years later, uh, I think the SNP were slightly hesitant to join the Yes Yes campaign. Is that right? And can you tell, tell us why that was and why it was crucial that we did? Because I think I heard G Gene Freeman say a number of years ago that we wouldn't have been forgiven, the SNP wouldn't have been forgiven for not joining the Yes Yes campaign because I think there's gradualism versus let's go for independence in one go. So there was a thing. bit of hoo-ha about it all and um, uh, there were um, some strong voices in the SNP who didn't want us to take any part in in that kind of, you know, the devolution campaign. But that, as I said, happened in 1979 as well. So there was a bit of that going on in 1979 too. So to a certain extent, I think these are... Um, the arguments you will always have with the SN in the SNP. I, I just think by definition, there's always that tension is always going to be there. Um, as, if it's around a devolution argument, because because devolution isn't our, our end goal. So you will always get that. And I, and I think you just have to accept that and argue, argue within the SNP for what does seem the most sensible and practical option at the time. So Jean was absolutely right. Um, it would have looked extraordinary if we had stood aside from it. And um, uh, I don't think the majority of people in the party wanted us to stand aside from it, uh, even if there were some um, prominent individuals who felt like that. Um, so, um, you know, so I don't... Um, but I, I just, to me, that's... And that's maybe where the, the kind of politics degrees that we, um, we have done and are doing um, come into play because you do begin to see that, that if you can take the telescope back out a bit and not just be focused on the SNP alone but actually take the telescope back out and see well actually that would always be a tension that is always going to be a question mark um, the difference I think now is so we have um, we had what I would call the, the, the status quo to independence continuum and you could plot a devolution settlement along the way so some devolution settlements would have been quite weak and closer to the status quo end of the continuum. Some some are further up the line. Um, and then we had a, a kind of left-right continuum, which is not the same two end points. So you have a kind of left-right continuum. And of course, we've now added a kind of remain Brexit continuum to that. So you can just see that things are a lot more, ironically, a lot more complicated. And everybody talks about politics being much more binary now. Um, but in reality, when you, again, when you pull the telescope back out a bit, you can see that it's become a bit more complicated because we've now got, if the SNP has to deal with three different continuums, it, it has to deal with the whole devolution to independence one, which is the historic one. That is the one we've always had to deal with. And then it deals with the left-right one, which again is one that we've had to deal with for quite a long time. And now there's another Brexit Remain one sitting on top of that. And, and you can just see that that's actually a complication, a set of complicated equations um, that the SNP has to manage. And to a certain extent, the other parties are having to manage that same set of complexities. Um, so I, I, I have, have enough capacity still, despite a lifetime in the SNP, to take myself a little bit back out of it to see it in in a broader sense 
um, and understand that some of these things are inevitable. Some of the rows are inevitable. That what would be more extraordinary would be if there weren't these debates and rows going on. And therefore, they are, in a sense, more a sign of health than anything else. So I don't get depressed by them. But then I would say that being, you know, one of the major dissidents and thorns in the side of the party hierarchy in 1979. <laughs> I think that the party, Rosanna, are dealing with those complexities better than, than other parties in Scotland and across the UK. So um, they're doing okay with that. Um, 2004, to kind of skip forward a wee bit, you announced that you would stand uh, in the leadership contest for the party. Could you have envisaged then how successful the party would end up being in 2007? And just to kind of follow on from that, you then got your first cabinet post in 2009. Could you give us a wee bit of an insight into that? Um, I think that was, sorry, you were a minister in 2009 yeah. as your first post. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I, I don't know that any of us, I mean, we, we didn't have a great election in 2003. So um, uh, we were we were feeling a little bit on the back foot. So um, the, the leadership election that followed the 2003 uh, election campaign uh, had been deputy leader. Um, I think it would have been a bit strange if I hadn't stood. Um, but I also remembered very clearly um, uh, a, a then former leader of the party saying that he was absolutely and totally fed up being told what to do um, as leader by people who had somehow uh, omitted to ever stand for leadership themselves and that individual was Alex Salmond so I thought well you know what I you know I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand and even when he decided that he would come back into the contest I just thought right if I back down and I knew that we would you know both Mike Russell and I knew fine well we weren't going to beat Alex Salmond but there was a kind of point of principle about you know having the debate having the argument and everybody not just kind of just given up and, and allowing it to move into the one seat. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that yeah, that 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 was fine. And then I just cracked on with doing my job. I I think I was the convener of the health committee at the time in the parliament. So just cracked on with doing my job. I had some other things that I was doing. I had a members' bill I was taking forward. I had um, a really big thing that I was starting to get off the ground as far as the constituency was concerned. And I was just having a great time. Um, uh, 2007 was a pretty extraordinary result, that single seat um, ahead of Labour. I rather suspect that at the time, Alex Salmond was probably the only one who would have had the absolute brass neck to just stand on the green outside the parliament and just say, we won reforming the government. I suspect um, uh, anybody else might have gone into talks or whatever so um that was quite extraordinary i have to say my recollection is however none of us really thought it would last very long <laughs> so most of us didn't think to be honest that 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 it was sustainable most of the external media didn't think it was sustainable um and i just remember that the, the, the line was that everybody just had to get out there into their communities and, and, and make sure that they were as visible as they could possibly be um, to make this government, fix this, this, this minority government in, in, the, in the minds of people. Um, and, and in a sense, that's kind of what happened. Um, 2009, yes, I got a phone call from Alec when I was sitting on the train at Glen Eagles Railway, uh, just pulling out of Glen Eagles Railway Station to go down to Edinburgh. Um, it was a Tuesday morning and I was sitting opposite a Labour MSP, <laughs> Peter Peacock. So I have Alec on the phone <coughs> telling me he wants me to be a minister. But of course, I'm sitting in front of Peter Peacock and I can't say anything on my side of the conversation that reveals to Peter Peacock what's happening. Um, uh, so I've got a slightly puzzled Alex Salmond wondering why I'm working with Joy and I'm having to say, no, I'm sitting here with Peter Peacock. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that that's pretty exciting. And uh, whatever you think you know, as a backbench, as a backbencher, you become a minister and you you move into a completely different space um it's a bit 
uh, overwhelming to start with. So I think the new ministers, the brand new ministers that we've got, um, uh, and I think there's about three that are brand new, um, Mary McCallan, Tom Arthur and George Adam. However much they thought they knew, it will still not be as much as, you know, confronts them in the job that they're in. Um, and then I became a cabinet secretary um, immediately after the referendum. And uh, um, again, whatever much you think you know as a junior minister, you go into a cabinet position. And again, it's like a big step up. It's a big change in responsibility, a big step up in responsibility. They are, you know, each of them big, big steps. And uh, the amount of work involved, people don't understand that how relentless it is. It is absolutely 24-7. Um, you have an entire private office on the government side whose job it is to make sure that your nose is kept to the grindstone of government. Um, and you have a parliamentary con slash constituency office whose job it is to make sure that you um, uh, cover all of the constituency bases. And to a certain extent, you spend your life just juggling the two things because it becomes it's very difficult um, uh, uh, to manage. But it's an enormous privilege and it's an extraordinary thing to have happened and I think if you had said to the 15 year old in Australia that you know one day you would be senior member of a Scottish National Party government in a parliament in Scotland uh, I I would have just I don't know I, I, I just I, if, if I had believed it, it you know it would just have been the most extraordinary thing to have known but you don't know, of course. You only these things always look seamless when you look back. But at the time when you're fifteen or sixteen or seventeen or eighteen or twenty-five or thirty or whatever, you can't see what's coming ahead of you. And don't forget, when I was elected in in, in nineteen ninety-five, I was forty-four years old. I wasn't a kid. I wasn't, you know, I I so so you young faces, you know, you've got plenty of time <laughs> to do these things. So don't don't be in a desperate hurry all the time because you've got loads of time to actually build some real some real background and some real heft about your politics. Um, uh, you, you know, you, you, just because you're not elected by the age of twenty four doesn't mean you're not you're not uh, you're not a successful individual. <laughs> something take something into the politics take something into the into your representation make a decision to stand for parliament when you've got something you really want to say um you know when you've got some real heft to bring to it and some real depth to add to what the party has i think that's really really important so i was 44 when i got elected no. looks are deceiving rosanna <laughs> you're very your mother brought you up <laughs> Uh, you're saying there how you became a, a minister uh, after the referendum in 2014. What was that? I mean, I'm, I'm cabinet young, secretary. I yeah, cabinet been, secretary. I do apologise. I've been a minister in two different portfolios, and then I became a cabinet secretary in a third portfolio. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm a bit too young to remember the referendum. I think Declan remembers it slightly yeah, better than I do. It fueled my political fire, as so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I came a few years later. Um, what was that like, being in the party so long and then here's a referendum to sort of achieve what the party was set up for and then what was the campaign like as as a, a, a very close uh, mm. ally to people who were in charge of the party and in charge of the government? Well, it was extraordinary, but I thought it went on far too long. Um, and I hope that the next one isn't anywhere near as long as that. Mm. Um, I, 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 I was, I was, I, I thought it was extraordinary the way the, the, the support for independence grew through, through the, through the campaign. Um, uh, and I, I don't know. I, I think all of us just, you were just holding your breath really in that last week or two. All of you, all of us. I mean, I, I just remember just thinking, are, are we going to be able to do this? Are we going to get this across the line? 
And you couldn't have said with certainty that you were going to get it across the line, but neither did it necessarily look you were going to get gubbed either because the opinion polls were just so, so tight. Um, and picking yourself up after it just is obviously quite hard, but we had no choice. We, you, you know, we were still in government. We, we still effectively um, ran uh, the, the, the country and that couldn't stop just because of the referendum. And it couldn't stop just because we were a bit disappointed about the referendum. Um, uh, and, and, and the same will be true the next time as well. You know, so government has to keep governing even when one of the major motivating, if not the major motivating force for all the government politicians being there has not been achieved. Um, and that, you know, the, the impact of that, I think, is, is, is quite massive. But we saw what happened in the months that followed the, the referendum. We saw the enormous wave of, of, of determination coming off the people of Scotland. And, you know, um, I think that bodes well for the future because it has created that incredibly solid base from which to have the next one. But we have to win the next one. I mean, we absolutely have to win the next one. There's, there's, because if we don't win the next one, um, then it will be a very long time before we get a third one. Yeah, I think timing's going to be right. And obviously, I think Nicola Sturgeon's strategy is going to be key here in terms of recovery first, then referendum, which I think she's made very clear, even though other parties would say different. Um, you went right into that cabinet secretary role. Rosanna, what has it been like in the past year being part of a government through COVID? Because I imagine that there must have been real uncertainty. There must have been really worrying discussions and meetings um, when you all got together around the table, socially distanced, may I add, or virtually. Um, how, how did that feel at first? Because you were going into the unknown in, you know, last year. And how did you, you steer it through? In my opinion, I think you've done a good job of steering it through part of that government. And I think the Scottish people um, spoke very clear in that mandate this month but how, how did it feel at the start of that and how did it kind of progress through being in government through a, a, a pandemic well our early meetings were still in person and i remember you know in, in february and march where it was beginning to be an increasing topic of conversation and we were still meeting physically i remember sitting at a cabinet meeting thinking how long are we actually going to be able to sit elbow to elbow here i mean it's this is not going to sustain for very long and indeed it didn't I remember the day that um, the FM stood up in the chamber and announced the lockdown um, that would be starting on the Monday following. And I just remember thinking, I've no idea when I'll see my family again, um, because, you know, my closest family live in Glasgow. And, um, and that, you know, um, the, the conversations around the table um, at, at first, I think, in truth, felt a little bit unreal. You, you know, it was a it, it was an extraordinary conversation that you were having to have, and you, you kept thinking, can this can this actually be real? I think back now. I went to Madrid for a long weekend, the first weekend in February, when we had the the February weeks recess. I mean, it just now when I look back, it seems extraordinary. A that we were still travelling um, at that point. Um, B that I did it. <laughs> Kind of glad I did because I sneaked it in just before we got, um, uh, and Linda and I had to cancel a Palma holiday at Easter. <laughs> so Whitby, Whitby this year was a very poor and poor substitute for the Palma holiday that we had to cancel last year. Um, I we went virtual very quickly, so cabinets were by telephone conference, mm. and. Yeah, there were, I mean, and then we were having other sets of meetings um, about the state of the economy. I was having um, meetings about uh, the climate change plan update coming off the back of the climate legislation and all of these things. So the, the, the main cabinet meeting, um, the, the, the separate economy meetings, the, the climate meetings, all against this backdrop of never really being certain from one week to the next what what situation was going to be like what what we were having to um to deal with and 
you know, I say that as somebody whose portfolio was quite far away from the centre of this. I think if you were interviewing Jean, have you interviewed Jean? Um, no, we're, we're hoping to get her on um, because she's had a, a time of it in the past year as health secretary for the pandemic. She was, she was in it at the at the heart of it. Now, you know, so all portfolios were involved and at Cabinet you make a collective decision, but the day-to-day -day stuff, you know, I wasn't having to deal with. I mean, I had to deal with the day-to-day -day stuff as it impacted my portfolio, but that's not quite the same thing as having to deal with the day-to-day -day stuff when you're the health secretary or the first minister. Um, and I really don't know, to be absolutely honest, I, I don't know how either of them stayed on their feet the whole way through. It, to mm. me, it's a miracle that they both stayed upright and and out of hospital themselves um, because, because it must have been and has been absolutely punishing um, for them. I mean, it was hard enough for everybody else, but absolutely punishing for the pair of them. And, uh, and there's a tendency to forget, of course, people have their own circumstances, you know, um, uh, to deal with. You know, the, the DFM, you know, his wife has multiple squirrels. So she was one of the people having to be shielded. So he's dealing with that and a small child at home, as well as being Deputy First Minister and, you know, involved of all of these things. So there's a tendency, I think, to forget that, that people have their own uh, circumstances and their own challenges just in their own personal lives and, uh, and to go through the last year. It's been, from a political perspective, to me, it doesn't really work. I can't, I mean, I can't see politics being done like this on any permanent basis. It has taught us that we can do more um, virtually than we ever thought possible, you know. Um, uh, so that's a good thing. But, but politics is about interactions between people. It's not always about formal meetings. It's about what happens when the meeting breaks for the cup of tea and the, and the jammy dodger, you know, on, at the table and the, and the, and the chance corridor conversations and the and the and all of that kind of stuff where you strip all that out of it that's what oils politics so the rest of it you can do and you can keep the show on the road but you're not really it's 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 a to me it's a bit stilted um in in the way you have to do it and you can't have a, a conversation you know we have to take turns here we can't actually have a conversation that we might have if we were sitting around the same table it would be a different experience it might be more difficult to transcribe afterwards or 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 broadcast or whatever but it would be more uh it would be more natural um yeah. so our meetings you know and some of them were huge meetings on the other hand it did teach you that there was a certain amount of stuff that could be done that way that we didn't always have to automatically default to physical meetings but i have to say the notion that this is going to keep like this for for any length of time is quite dispiriting because I, I, I don't think it's good for any of us and it's not how we exchange ideas you know it's not a good way to exchange ideas um, so the last year has just been extraordinary um, and and to live through it I it, it feels almost surreal but I'm sure that's a word that just about everybody has used at some point in the last year that you were actually living through this and I kept thinking to myself I feel like I'm in the first 15 minutes of every one of those disaster movies where everybody's still thinking that these are just small things that have changed and the radio is on in the background or the telly's on in the background and some report of something has happened and the people are still just pouring the milk into the cereal and making their coffee and going out to work and the 15 minutes of all of these movies all starts that way and I kept thinking, this feels like we're in the first 15 minutes of all those disaster movies. And is how much worse is this going to get? But of course, the vaccine has changed all of that. Yeah. The speed with which we got to the vaccine has changed all of that. Yeah, People are do. really terrified, absolutely terrified as males. You should read the novel, The End of Men, which was written by somebody in 1918, 1990. 1990, not 1918, 20, 2018, 2019, about a virus that only um, infects men, and only one in 10 of men are immune. 90% of men die 
from this virus. And the whole book is about lockdown and social distancing and coping with the deaths and all the rest of it. And it was written about a year before. <laughs> well, actually, you give that a read. Get off, you get off there. <laughs> but, yeah. End of Men. It was only just published a, about a month ago. You should read it. You'll probably be scared to death when you read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it never comes true. <laughs> no. uh, um, yeah, as you were saying, we're hopefully coming out of this um, pretty soon with the vaccine rollout. Uh, one of the first in the world, hopefully, to come out of it with the vast majority vaccinated. Mm. Uh, and we've also had the election recently. So mm -hmm. just to ask you what you think of the results, some of the pop-up parties that failed to get parliamentary representation. And I think it's 45% of the parliament are women now. And you mm -hmm. mentioned how the atmosphere in 1995 in Westminster wasn't the best. So what do you think of the progress that we've made in female representation? Well, I think that female representation in the Scottish Parliament has always been better than the House of Commons, and that does change the, the atmosphere. I mean, it doesn't take the politics away. You know, I mean, you know, women are still members of their respective political parties and still fiercely, fiercely um, strongly proponents of whatever their own political um, ideas are. Um, but I think that this has taken a big step forward, and that's really, really good. Um, uh, I think that will be important in, in the way the debates take place. Um, uh, the election, I thought, was a great result. It's a pity we didn't get another seat out of it. Pity we didn't get a slightly um, bigger pro-Indy um, majority, but we've got a big pro-Indy majority and I think a really explicit mandate, which is perhaps the more important thing. Um, I, I think, I don't know, I, would, I, uh, I, I think we probably at some point need to have a look at the, the, the voting system. I, I don't think when it was designed that uh, those people who designed it had in mind um, list-only parties and what I call pop-up shell parties, shell parties that are not really political parties at all. Um, I'm hugely critical of the Electoral Commission's complete failure to address the serious issue around deliberate misrepresentation in these these list parties that are shell parties. So I do think there is a really um, there's a real issue around that um, uh, that needs to be addressed. But equally, um, I think we need to be looking much more carefully at all of the Electoral Commission applications that come in from these various daft groups. Um, because one of the things the Electoral Commission said about the independent Green Boys in Glasgow was that nobody had objected at the time the, the, the application for um, uh, registration had been made. So eye off the ball all round in that one. Um, and I do think that, that we're gonna have to take all of that more seriously. But I also do not believe that it was originally thought that we would have this plethora of pop-up kind of ghost parties that who are only intending to stand on the list um, and who don't comprise any more than a handful of people and uh, if, if at all. So uh, I, 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 I do think there needs to be a kind of longer, harder look at that. Um, you know, but voting systems aren't the sexiest things in the world to have to talk about. And um, uh, generally it's a big turn off for people outside politics. However exciting it seems for people inside politics is one of those things that will just be seen as a big distraction. But I do think there are some issues arising out of what we what we saw, um, and and um, I'm I'm glad that uh, um, voters didn't real really fall for some of it. So I was mm. I was hugely relieved um, uh, that that was the case. Um, but I think that the situation in the Glasgow list vote was extremely unfortunate. And as I said, I I think the electoral commission. I'm disappointed that the electoral commission is not taking that more seriously. I think we need to take that kind of thing more seriously because you can see how easily it would be abused. People think they can get away with that kind of nonsense. It has to be challenged every time. So it's on us, I guess, to be checking the Electoral Commission kind of registration applications on a pretty consistent basis to make sure that that sort of thing doesn't slip through again. Just finally, from me, Rosanna, um, you've now stood down from... Part, well, not party politics, you're still a member of the party, but you've now stood down from government, you're not no longer in Holyrood. Um, 
what are your plans post retirement? Obviously, we're still living with COVID. You both are very lucky to be in level two, while I'm stuck in uh, level three hotspot COVID Glasgow, which I hope to change very soon. Um, but what's your plans um, post uh, being an MSP? Well, so. Oh. Um, I, I suppose I always imagined that uh, when I did retire, there would be a lot of travel. Ha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's that's kind of one issue. Um, I would have hoped for slightly better weather so I could have enjoyed my garden a bit more. Ha, there's another one. Uh, it's not going well so far. Oh, it's not going well so far. Um, uh, Linda and I did manage to eat our way through a ton of seafood last week in Whitby, so that 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 was quite good. We wouldn't have been doing that had we not retired. Um, so, um, I, to, to be honest, I absolutely don't know. I've got a few things at a personal level I want to do. You know, one of the things I want to do is learn how to speak Italian properly, as opposed to the kind of pigeon Italian that I have at the moment. But I always thought one of the ways I was going to do that was maybe to go off to Italy and spend a couple of months in Italy, but that's not going to happen soon. So, um, you know, so there are a few things like that. And, and there, there may be other um, kind of campaigning possibilities. I mean, there's obviously going to be an independence referendum. So I very strongly, you know, want to be um, very much involved in that. Um, um, and, and, you know, there are other things that will come up, other perhaps single issue campaigns where I couldn't have been part of in government. So, so there is a freedom um, that allows you to start being more um, overtly uh, um, uh, campaigning on behalf of, of one particular thing. I mean, you can't do that when you're in government because anything you do or say will be taken to mean that that's what the government wants to do or say. So that's not always necessarily the case. So I'm just keeping my eyes out um, for a few um, of those interesting things. And... Um, and coming to terms with the fact that when I always thought that it was a lack of time that meant I didn't do all that housework, turns out time wasn't the problem after all. <laughs> turns out it was the So maybe learning a few things about myself. <laughs> well, just finally for me to wish you a, a happy retirement and thank you very much for coming on. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Great. Yep. Thank nice you, Rosanna. Guys, um, and good luck with all of the things that you're doing. Um, and uh, I wish you every success in your own futures and careers. Thank you very much. Thank you.